Welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers podcast, the podcast that can't drive, so can't test its eyes. This week on Heart and Hand, hey man, what's your rush? So, welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers podcast. Podcast. My name's David Edgar, and I'm joined this week by that sun-kissed son of the East Coast. It's Cameron James Bell. Hello, Cammy. Hello, David. How are you, my friend? I'm all right. Uh, as you know, I'm not a particular fan of the sunshine, so uh, I tend to just go out for a little bit and then come inside and go, it's too warm. It's like as if you go outside to make sure outside is still there, and yeah. you still don't like it, and then you no. retreat back to your habitat. Yes. Um yeah, it's, it's 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 I'm not I'm not keen on it, and then especially this time of year when people all go out into their gardens and you can hear them, and you know that I really just no sends me Scotland inside for a pair of decent headphones. But I do enjoy talking to people remotely and talking to them about Rangers, and that's why our listeners are here this week uh, on time this week. Apologies for the podcast being late last week. I'm sure you understood why it was late, of course, when we had an exclusive, genuinely exclusive interview with Yanis Hadji after he signed for the Teds. And, of course, we discussed that signing. Now, it ruffled a few feathers in the media, Cameron, with uh, a lot of the traditional mainstream media complaining that it had been given to us rather than to them. And I I think that having thought about it for a few days, my attitude remains the same, which is fuck them. Um, I'm not quite sure where they get off on this sense of entitlement that they put the boot into Rangers constantly for no reason at all. They make shit up about Rangers and then they expect Rangers to hand them exclusives. Now, anyone who's listened to this pod for a while, we're coming up to our 10th anniversary. Anyone who's listened to this pod will know that we put the boot into Rangers when they deserve it, when Rangers do something wrong, when Rangers play poorly, when Rangers players don't behave the way we want them to when the club does or doesn't do things that we as fans consider to be right but we do it fairly what we don't do is sit down on a monday and say right lads let's make some shit up about rangers that it'll be controversial at least and will get us some attention it doesn't have to be true and then turn around to rangers and say by the way you need to give us loads of content no and, and we don't go out of our way to expressly find Rangers haters in order to be able to comment on certain stories and then obviously have to retract uh, those comments because the truth has come to light about how much these people hate Rangers and how much they have uh, openly spoken about that um, publicly beforehand, tainting uh, their validity. Um, yeah, it's um, it's interesting, as you say, David, to, to see this appalling level of self-entitlement where they did. And, and, and again, I'm not you know, breaking confidences by saying this. Um, the club did get quite a lot of pressure back from uh, journalists in the mainstream media to say, you know, why didn't we get this? Why didn't we get X, Y and Z? And the club rightly uh, turned around and said, because you have a clear agenda against our club and our fans, um, you constantly, whenever you possibly can, put the boot in. And as a result of that, we are not going to entertain um, any of your nonsense any longer and uh, and that's why we were fortunate enough to be able to get I mean there's nothing to do with the fact that Yanis Hadji obviously has bought a house in Kilwinning and you obviously mm-hmm. did that interview over the garden fence I mean that's obviously totally separate um, but again uh, the, the, the press just enjoy the, the opportunity to be able to have a, a moan and a grumble um, and I'm so glad that um, they're now starting to see that they can't get away with this any longer that would be cool, actually. Me and Yana said down to the Victoria Bar. I mean, I don't drink, and obviously he shouldn't. So there you go. That was, you know, we two two diet cokes. But but still, um, you'd, st- you'd would, still make him buy the round, though. Absolutely, he's got more money than me. Um, <laughs> so dude, there's absolutely no doubt about that. But yeah, I, it, it's a peculiar thing that they complain. And obviously, they, they, well, we have you know the size of us. Well, no offense, but we had more listeners last week than the Daily Record or the Sun get newspaper sales so that's out the window and where else are you going to put it you're going to put it on the internet like we can do that you're going to put it on 
Apple, Amazon, we do that. It, it, it's pointless. So obviously I'm going to be defensive about it, but uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's more a case of them needing to raise their game than us needing to do anything. But I hope people enjoyed it. And obviously we spoke about the, the Hadji signing this week. Ross Wilson has uh, come out this week, Cami, and said Rangers you know, do continue to move forward in the transfer market, looking to add quality rather than quantity, which is good news. But of course we did hear this this time last year, we had a different sporting director at the time, and uh, there was some debate um, about some of the, the, the transfer policies that he might have had in place. And I think there is a general feeling. I never like to, you know, the, you know, the Rangers support can't be spoken as universally, but at the best of the times. But I think that there was a general feeling that we had a number of players in the squad, quite quite a large squad, but a number of players that for want of a better term, that you couldn't always rely upon in matches. And therefore, there's not an awful lot of point having those players there. And that I think there is a feeling, Ross Wilson has spoken about it, so it's it's clearly there among the club, but certainly the, the support would encourage bringing in players who can contribute. And then rather than having, with the best will in the world, jersey fillers, guys who are just there, that maybe that's the kids can do that. You know, the youngsters can fill in if needed. And instead, you can concentrate because I think it became clear throughout the season that we had a core of players that we could trust and the manager could trust, and maybe even not enough of them, which is why you know we we, we fell away at the end. But we definitely had a few players that you just think, no, you know, a squad player needs to be somebody that when they come in, yeah, of course there's a drop, right? That's that's any club that's going to happen, even the, the the big, you know, the biggest richest clubs that's got the bigger leagues rather, uh, that's going to happen. But you do need to be able to bring in players where you go, I okay then, rather than oh my god, I know it's a huge, huge drop in level. You do, but then, whilst I totally appreciate, you know, the the, the fans will have their own thoughts on particular players where not so-and-so could still do a job where not that maybe that that individual player leaving is going to be uh, you know the wrong decision in terms of where that sits at what fans I think can agree on is that we've had uh, quite a few milestones in terms of the progression of the squad across the last five or six years and what you've got to look at as well David is that across that period in terms of obviously what we've had to go through and the levels that we've been competing at across that period we've had to go through major rebuilds and you know how many times have we sat in the pod when we were sitting in the summer and saying oh well it's going to be another squad change it's going to be something totally different and then what's happened and and we're probably now seeing a stage where you know 2018 we've beaten Celtic at home for the first time in the league in god knows how long 2019 we've beaten Celtic away for nearly 10 years we fell off a cliff uh, in 2020 in terms of our consistency in our form uh, there isn't as far as I'm concerned players who were pulling their weight at that time um, so you've got two things there, the first thing is you've got guys behind them in the pecking order who aren't going to challenge and you've also got probably a lack of uh, of real concerted quality across the squad which inspires those first teamers to be able to try and raise their game up to that type of level and that's what it's all about. How many times have you heard Rangers legends uh, talking about, you know, in training it was 150%. It was going into tackles. <laughs> it was doing absolutely everything you possibly could. And if I'm being honest with you, I don't think that you could find too many Rangers fans who would turn around and say that uh, 2020 showed that we had that type of attitude. So there has to be a, a, a progressive level of the type of player that we're looking to bring in because we're competing at different levels now. Um, we were competing for the league at the beginning of January, and obviously we, we you know, our, our, our form absolutely fell apart at that stage. But that's what we need to fix. That's what we need to address, and that's why you need to buy quality so that when that happens, you've got players with the talent, with the capability, uh, to to eke out results that beforehand you're turning into a draw or a loss, which again happened too frequently. So there's a requirement for it. I don't believe that anyone could argue that there isn't. Um, and I'm glad to hear Ross Wilson say that that's exactly what we should be recruiting for. Yeah, uh, I think that that's key for us next season, that 
you also need to have a few of these guys. We spoke about it last week. I suppose we're just going to keep banging on about this. You need to have a few of those, maybe not the most technical players in the world, but winners. And those are the guys I want to see coming in. Guys with that attitude, that fight, that, that bit of devilment, that spark that Rangers have maybe lacked at times where it's a case of just gritting your teeth and getting through it. And we've all seen it in away matches because it's it, it, Rangers were so often in winning positions uh, in the second half of the season and contrived somehow to not get away with the points and, and league winning teams don't do that league winning teams find a way by hook or by crook but just get yourselves over the line and onto the next one and we were doing that earlier in the season but you know obviously there's more pressure as you get further into the season and it, it just seemed to be a quality we didn't have those guys that you're talking about you're right and certainly within the 90 minutes of a league game where, as you say, you're, you're, you're turning a win into a draw or a draw into a defeat, those guys are the ones that turn it around. But what they also do is arrest the slide of, you know, two games where your drop points turn into three, turn into four. And, and, and we had too many of those games back to back across the course of, of the latter part of last season. And those are the guys who turn around and say, look, you know, OK, worst case scenario, you drop points at whatever ground. However, come Saturday or come Wednesday or whenever we're back to it, that's completely unacceptable for it to, to, to be allowed to happen again. And those are the guys who, I think, like you say, maintain the standards from that, that perspective. That, that You're not going to win a league in Scotland unless you've got guys in a team that will drive you forward and get you over the finish line because it's not all about flair and skill and you know delicate touches and all that. Sometimes you just need to go and you have to grind it out. And that's why you need... You know, proper guys in there who will, um, you know, drag you along if you have to be there, um, and, and get that result for you. Yeah, I mean, even that advocate treble team the first year, there was Ian Ferguson was still there. You know, there was Gordon Jury was still there. There were guys that knew how it was done and and what to do to kind of get you over the line. John Brown was still in the coaching staff, etc. So I do think that that is important. And it looks as though football in Scotland may be returning in August. Certainly has been given permission by the Scottish Government in the top league, uh, uh, anyway, to return behind closed doors in August. And that is something that uh, seems to be getting pushed for by the SPFL. Um, Celtic have also announced that they would like the fixtures released as soon as possible, even though they're not normally out by this time of the year. And they would like to know what they're doing a little bit quicker this year. Um, it does beg the question, Cami, given we're looking at Germany are back playing and that they are finishing the league and England are coming back in the middle of June and they're going to finish their league and obviously you, know, you can go through various other leagues. What was the mad rush? Yeah, it's curious, isn't it? It's curious. It's almost as if it was just a, a concerted effort. Some would use the word conspiracy um, in order to ensure that our league was wrapped up as quickly as it possibly could to... Um, you know, award titles to ensure that certain teams are relegated um, and pretty much uh, almost all member clubs disenfranchised. So, yes, very, very curious. Um, but then I I'm also very much uh, bewildered as to why Celtic seem to think as if they'd need to have the fixture list ASAP. And I've got, I mean, I'm not drawing any lines between the fact between now and the fixture list coming out where the first old firm game would happen to be played. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed, and that would be behind closed doors. Um, you know, you you have to say that both for Rangers and I suppose for Celtic, that behind closed doors you would think would benefit us because, with all due respect, we've better players than the other teams, and we know other teams raise their games, and we know other teams' supports raise their the you know raise their levels, and it's a bigger crowd, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When they, when they play Rangers. And of course, we know that there is pressure put on, certainly, Rangers by our own fans and our desperation for silverware. And it, it's been interesting in the Bundesliga that there are significantly more away wins. I think of the first 30 games, there were only six home wins, which is obviously you know, a, a smaller sample than we can draw definitive conclusions. But it's certainly interesting. And... You would expect in any league, really, with the better players, just a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, or rather 11-11, I suppose, match against 
another team that, that does have, with the best will in the world, the atmosphere of a training ground match, certainly initially, then you would expect the better teams will win more often because you don't have that outside pressure. You don't have the the fans sitting on you, the intensity that that drives. Um, you know, is it, it's maybe a sad thing to say about this Rangers team, but is there an argument that perhaps they would do better? Um, or certainly... Yeah, it'll be tough to see because it, it looks like it'll be the first half of the season and we tend to be good in that anyway. Well, yeah, certainly. Um, I, I tend to think about it maybe in the opposite scenario where, um, listen, I absolutely don't want, you know, closed closed door games are abhorrent to me. Um, the the um, a necessity, obviously, for a public safety uh, protection element. But there's also the point where you know yourself, David, we've been at Ibrox where um, if, a team, if a team come to sit in and stifle us, the crowd start to get on top of the, uh, you know, the we, we start to get on top of the Rangers, start to get on top of the, the, the players. Um, and the opposition fair, sense fair, that as well. They do. And I think the thing is, though, that even for away fans, they start to expect, and then they start becoming a bit noisy and stuff as well. So there's, there's also the probably the benefit where um, it would give some of our players a little bit more time to just not feel that kind of pressure. But because you and I have both been there, you, you know, it's tangible. You, you can You can feel it. Um, in terms of that, that growing concern, or maybe even Hell, like I'm, say, I'm uh, part of it. I must, just, <laughs> I must be sitting there giving off those vibes myself. Yeah. There. I'm not, not the, and, the biggest and, shout at the game, but you know, you you can tell if you talk to me, I'm I'm frustrated. Yeah, the, I mean, you know, you think of, I mean, I'll go back to to times when uh, I think it was Hibs when we were, uh, I think we were a goal up, and then um, you know they had a corner in the last minute that took it seemed for me forever to take. And it was just because I was so nervous that it was going to go in and it, turned, it came to nothing. Uh, but, you know, times that by 50,000, uh, you've got a very uh, a very nervous situation that kind of comes in. So um, I think, as I say, everyone's disadvantaged by closed door games. There's no doubt about that. But um, you think you're right. There's going to be some circumstances where it could be slightly different in terms of the way how the games are played, the tempo of the games. Um, it would be very interesting as to how that works across a longer term impact. But having said all of that, the sooner we can get back to games, the better. The other big news, of course, of this week, Cammy, was that the SPFL have received a proposal from Hearts to reconstruct the league to three leagues of 14, changing back within a year or two at the most. It hasn't met an awful lot of popular reaction with at least one championship club manager saying it's less reconstruction and more let's save Hearts. Uh, Lachlan Cameron of Area United even said that it would lead to a situation in a couple of years where 40% of the team's in a division were to be relegated. He said that's like the Hunger Games and uh, therefore not something that they're too keen on. With uh, it needing an 11-1 vote in the top league alone in the, champ- in the Premiership, sorry, that it looks highly unlikely. At least three teams are said to be 100% against it. Um, then came the news that Hearts have an investor, a guy called the, uh, by the name of James Anderson, who's a hedge fund manager, and he has been a benefactor to Hearts over the last few seasons, uh, said to have pumped in around about £3 million of his own money. He has suggested he would be willing to contribute money to all 42 SPFL clubs to help tend them over and, and help them get through this coronavirus crisis. Um, and he doesn't apparently want anything in return. Um, the SPFL have issued a statement on today, as we record Monday, saying that they have had constructive discussions and things are going ahead. Now, a heart fan who's offering money for no reason whatsoever, I wonder if I can see the flaw. Yes, yes. I mean, heaven forbid that uh, an SPFL member club should put money um, and its own self-interest at the the heart of what it's looking to be able to try and uh, achieve out of this. So, yeah, well done to your man for what appears to be quite openly offering backhanders to everybody across all of the divisions in order to make this happen. Listen, it, it's a mockery of a serious point. Hearts have been truly, truly battered by this. And um, it, it's serious. Relegation is a serious, serious issue for clubs. Um, and, and Hearts... The problem that you have with Hearts at the moment just now is, apart from Ann Budge, in my opinion, not being strong enough and credible enough to lead a, a real charge regarding reconstruction, is that she should be nowhere near it. What she should be doing, in my opinion, is going back to the SPFL and saying, look, 
you need to tell me as to how I can avoid major cost cutting as a result of relegation, premature relegation, because you have decided to call the leagues early and fundamentally coerce clubs into calling the leagues early. As a result of that, I need you to, to, to tell me how you can help me via financial compensation and what happens at that point. And then you just need to accept it because I cannot see a scheme, a mechanism, a structure, any kind of formula that's really going to come in to save hearts. It's just not going to happen. And your man, the investor, can give as much money as he wants to all these other member clubs. Celtic aren't going to vote for it. Hibs aren't going to vote for it. People who know that Welsh, you might take a sweetener at the beginning of a season, but ultimately if that costs you X amount in terms of overall revenue because you're now potentially playing a slightly different amount of fixtures and that's going to um, strangle you within your, your, your revenue streams, won't, won't go for it. It's just not feasible. So Hearts need to work with the SPFL and say, look, what do we do here? Because on a very serious note, when you're talking about livelihoods and you're talking about people's jobs, um, they need to say, look, you know, how do I minimise redundancies? Can you give me something that's going to help me cushion the blow as a result of this? Because, again, like you say, they have been totally screwed over. See, if they did that, David, I would have no doubt whatsoever that the SPFL and Hearts could sit down and say, look, here is whatever amount of cash, minimise or completely remove the idea of redundancies at your club for the next 18 to 24 months. That's it. And don't sue us. Everyone walks away from the table happy. And whilst I can appreciate that Hearts would still feel very pissed off about the set of circumstances, you're not going to get away from it. I mean, I, I've lost the league as a result of this. Do I think we're going to win the league when we're 13 points behind? Absolutely. You know, there's still an outside chance, but, you know, <laughs> the, the the real answer is no, we weren't going to win it. But we've had to accept it. Hearts are going to have to accept it as well. Yeah, I, I, I understand. I mean, Hearts have already freed 15 first team players, which, by the way, makes the idea that they're going to continue to play the Scottish Cup an absolute joke. Um, next season when Hearts will have a completely different side and may not even be playing because the, there's talk of mothball in the championship till um, till January so I mean it, it's just a, a complete non-starter but they're battering ahead anyway because well we know why but um, I, the reason I think this affects Rangers is that you know Rangers haven't gone away after the to and fro with the SPFL over the last eight weeks or so. They're waiting to see it's heart the balls in Hearts Court with regards to legal action and Budge has threatened legal action. And I think Rangers are waiting to see what happens there before they make their next move. And certainly I think it's important because we can't let this go. Here we have a league where it has no sponsors for next season. There's potential liabilities. It faces serious challenges. And the only talk of investment coming into the game is by a member club. The executive and the team whose job it is to go out and find that are unable to because they're too busy concentrating on stitching up a title for one club. And this is, I think, part of the problem that Scottish football doesn't get any further forward because you've got agendas, you've got people working to to different things and you don't have an overall body that is strong enough at the top to be able to resist pressure from particular clubs, vested interest, whatever you want to call it, and just go and do the best for the game regardless. Because it was quite clear at the start, either you hand out championships to everybody, but everybody gets relegated, or you null and void it. Th those were the options. You can't have a mishmash of it, but in true Scottish football style, that's exactly what they're going for. And it's unlikely to work. It will be open to legal challenges. Hearts of insisted and clearly they've got a backer who can fund their uh, financial challenges they've insisted that they will because as you say it's a bigger thing for them than merely what division that they play in equally the reconstruction plan you know got laughed out of court the first time they're back again with a kind of desperation bid but you know, if you're one of the teams who will find themselves down there uh, that season you know St Johnston, Hamilton, whoever you'd be off your nut to vote for it. You'd be insane to, to to make your chances of relegation significantly bigger. So it, it just appears to be a complete non-starter that the FPFL are quite happy to sort of stroke Hart's uh, ego and tell them, no, no, it's got a chance of getting through while I'm sure simultaneously knowing that there is absolutely no chance at all that it will get through. And the longer it goes, then 
the more stasis happens around our game and it leaves us in the situation we're in. With regards to this August the 1st restart date, Cammy. now we've seen from this weekend that lockdown has been officially eased down south, certainly is coming in Scotland. It kind of looks like we've hit the, the bit where it is passing for, for a lot of people, not for everybody, but for a lot of people now, I think there is this feeling of, right, okay, it's time to start pushing back towards normal. But even so, will it be a, a case of situation that if we start and players start falling ill, if there is a second wave, which, you know, the, the science doesn't suggest, I, I, I don't think, but equally we don't know, it's, it's a brand new situation. Could we find ourselves starting up only to, to grind to a halt again? Is it too early, I suppose, is what I'm asking. Um. I suppose yes and no. Um, the challenge that we've got, as you say, in terms of obviously the the roadmap in front of us to be able to try and look at the varying levels of of lockdown removal will will probably dictate what happens um, regarding sporting events. And um, if I'm being perfectly honest, if there's still a risk to any of our players potentially catching this, then it is too early. And and as much as I want to see Rangers play football again. I am absolutely not willing to do it at the risk of anyone's health. Now, yes, you're talking about professional athletes, but you're also talking about guys who are as human as the next person. You don't know as to what could happen with them. You don't know what could happen if they potentially catch it off of someone else within the team and then obviously they're then going back to family. It's very, very sticky. I think that we've been fortunate we've seen some of the, the, the other nations' leagues already start back up again in terms of obviously Germany, Denmark, etc., England, um, are a couple of weeks away from doing so as well. Um, as a little bit of a kind of trial to see as to how it goes, I think if you're going to put yourself into position and you just alluded to it there, where you're going to try and and restart the Scottish Cup semi-finals again, um, why is there such an urgent need for us to be able to try and put more games in when they're not they're not needed? Um, allow the league format to be able to try and get there because what people also need to remember with the move of the European Championships from this summer to next summer, we need to finish by a certain date as well. That's what mm. this season was designed to do. Um, so we need to be very, very cautious about where that where that can go. Um, and again, to come back slightly, is the point we just touched on there as well regarding the SPFL and their um, snail-like progress being able to move on this. You've seen that, especially in Germany, when you're talking about the varying levels of testing, they're about to do that with Project Restart in England, that it's expensive. There is costs attached to this in terms of who, who's paying that? Do the clubs pay that? Because if that has to happen, then Wales, we might be able to afford it, you know, for want of a, you know, other clubs, Stenhouse Muir couldn't. Alloa might not be able to, Air might not be able to. These clubs are having to protect every penny they have. So does that then mean that? the governing bodies, whether it's SPFL or SFA, they then pay for these testing kits. What is it that happens here? So it, it's, it, it feels to me that we have to start making decisions. And that's why I'm frustrated about what's happening regarding Hearts and the SPFL not making progress on this. Because if they were being true towards that date, that's about eight weeks away, David. It is going to be here before you know it. So they need to start working towards that if that is going to be a true target. Because if it's not, the next thing that has to go in my mind is how do we eliminate the, the need for certain competitions? Do we get rid of the Scottish Cup as it was? Do we get rid of the League Cup? And then we start the Scottish Cup next year. January, that's, yeah. our only, that's our only cup competition other than the League. So that that way you're not having a fixture backlog. Because it'll happen. I absolutely guarantee it'll happen. Yeah, well, I think it's it's undoubtedly um, because we'll still have all the Scottish crazy weather postponements or that kind of stuff, you know, closed door or not, that that is liable to happen. So we'll need to see what the the process is for rescheduling games. Everything, you know, th as you say, it needs decisions, and we don't get decisions. Um, we get plans, uh, and the the best laid one of them gang are I, as as someone once pointed out. So yeah, it, it it's a situation that. I think need some clarity from people who seem to be masters of befuddled thinking. A bit of good news for Rangers, though, was the MyGel scheme passed 10,000 members, um, which obviously means a lot of investment into the club at this point. 10,000 members for a new scheme um, based on really away tickets when we don't know when we're going to be playing games or going to them. Um, that's a remarkable investment, really, into the club by the support. 
phenomenal. Um, as, as much as I say it, it's, it's phenomenal, but not surprising, if that makes sense, because we're incredibly loyal. Um, I, I think that um, the scheme was always going to be very, very popular. Um, I, I think that it's great to be able to try and see somebody be some money being invested back in the club um, at a time when, like you say, nothing is coming in through the door. Um, but yeah, absolutely fantastic to be able to see the fan base take up on it. Um, I, and I think that what's also really exciting about it as well, David, is that I think that my jails, this is a little bit of a, a start of our ten. I think that the scheme and the and the you know the whole the the structure of it will evolve as time goes on. Um, so we'll make it better, we'll make it slicker, we'll 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 do certain things and just learn as we go. And there's a great sample size in there to be able to say what we can do next, what works, what doesn't work, you know, and, and, and really evolve it and progress it. And I think that's that's a, that's a great thing to be able to try and see the uptake in it. So, uh, yes, absolutely well done to everybody who's signed up. Because it does need evolved. It, it, we need to see it in practice because obviously there are people who are unhappy with it and the, you, clearly you've got to get it to the stage where as many people, not everyone will be happy with it, but as many people as possible iron out those wrinkles, see things that don't work. So, yeah, but uh, even so, uh, I think uh, a remarkable testament yet again to the loyalty of Rangers fans. Right, folks, that will do us for this week. We will, of course, be back next week on the flagship. Until then, though, come and join the party over at our Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash heart and hand where we have some fantastic content going out every single day from just one ninety nine, You get your Rangers news on a daily basis, in fact, in our daily update show. Plenty of other Rangers content, plenty of football content, with it all kicking back off again, and even plenty of non-football content as well, just to entertain you as you sit out in your garden. My thanks to Cami for joining me today. Thanks, David. A pleasure as always. And my thanks to our executive producers in London, Mr. Mike Lee and Mr. Paul Myers. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back next week. Until then, stay safe. Take care. Bye bye.